Today we continue our virtual pilgrimage in Israel. We are going to make our way down the slopes of the Mount of Olives from the little teardrop church down to the Garden of Gethsemane. Now we have all probably heard about the Garden of Gethsemane. We assume Jesus went there often to pray, to be alone with his disciples, to, to really seek God's will, and particularly we know on that last night of his life before the crucifixion on Monday, Thursday, after they completed the Seder meal, the Passover meal, they made their way out of Jerusalem, across the Kidron Valley, and to the Garden of Gethsemane, where Jesus prayed, and he prayed, you know, Father, if there's any way that this cup can be taken from me, let it be taken from me. He was essentially saying, I don't want to do this, but of course he so beautifully and lovingly said, but not my will, but yours be done. And then he went and allowed himself to be arrested and um, killed for you and for me. Today in the Garden of Gethsemane, you kind of have two different ways of experiencing the garden. On the outside of the church, there are uh, little gardens, and they are uh, the highlights of those gardens are these huge, ancient, ancient olive trees. And actually, the word Gethsemane means olive press, and so we know there were olive trees there. There was an olive press there where they would have made uh, olive oil from, from the olives that they harvested right there in, in that garden. Uh, for years and years and years, it has been said that those trees are 2,000 years old and that they were there that evening when Jesus prayed. In 2012, uh, there was some uh, uh, carbon dating done of those trees and their dates were found to be anywhere from around the year 1,000 to around the year 1,200. So the trees that are there are very ancient, but they don't go all the way back to Jesus. However, and this is one of the neat ways that science can help us, I think, spiritually. Uh, they also did a DNA test on all of those trees and discovered that they all came from the same parent tree. They may all have been the same tree grafted on to ancient roots. And the idea is that uh, around the year 1000 or maybe even all the way up to the year 1200, as the ancient trees that had been there when uh, Jesus was there were beginning to die, when their trunks and their upper uh, uh, stories were beginning to die off, uh, they grafted on to those ancient, ancient roots, trees, uh, perhaps probably saplings or seedlings from those uh, ancient, ancient trees and continued, maybe even taking a branch from one of those trees and grafting it back on. And so there's the, the sense in which that the trees, even though they aren't 2,000 years old, that, that part of them still kind of were there. Uh, I was just overtaken with being able to actually put my hand on a living thing that maybe was there at the time of Jesus. There's so many places, of course, in the Holy Land that you can experience uh, uh, being in a place where Jesus was, but to actually touch a living thing where Jesus was is pretty powerful. Well, right next to the garden there, you go into the Church of All Nations. It's the third church that has been on that site. It was built uh, in the early 1900s, and a number of uh, different nations and different denominations in those ages, different churches, uh, sent money to Jerusalem for this church to be built. And so it is beautifully, I think, called the Church of All Nations because this is where Jesus made that decision that he would allow himself to die for all nations, for all people. The central point of the church, or the focal point of the church, is a large slab of bedrock, which is exposed there in the floor. And the legend is that this is where Jesus knelt and prayed that powerful, powerful prayer. And the, the bedrock is surrounded by a little wrought iron um, fence that's just maybe a foot or two high that has almost looks like maybe a crown of thorns kind of thing uh, surrounding that rock. And you can kneel at the rock Place your hand on the rock and pray as well. And it was one of the, the many times when I was in Israel when my prayers just were so fervent. And, and my prayer then was just as you prayed here, you know, my will, not my will, but yours be done. God, please help me to know your will and to do your will. Let's think just a little bit theologically about the Garden of Gethsemane and what happened there. What happens in the Garden of Gethsemane, in my mind, is the entire history of the universe is teetering at that moment. 
Jesus, with all of his humanity, does not want to die. He does not want to undergo all that he's going to have to undergo. Uh, almost doubly reinforced by the fact that his disciples can't even stay awake. He knows that uh, Judas is going to betray him, that Peter is going to deny him. Why die for these people? And so he prays, God, I don't want to do this. And he could have gotten up and run away. He didn't have to die. And in that day and age, there weren't cell phone tracking and there wasn't all of that good kind of thing. And he could have, have run away and hidden and died a natural death and not died for you and me. And yet he chooses to die. Not my will, but yours be done. There's a meme going on around uh, right now that shows George Floyd and then it lists all of his arrest record, everything that he had done in his life that was uh, not honorable. Uh, it mentions that he died with illegal drugs in his system and the uh, uh, message of the meme is essentially maybe he deserved to die. Maybe he wasn't such a good guy after all. Uh, he did do some bad things in his life. He was arrested uh, a number of times in his life. He also was a Christian missionary and did a lot of wonderful work in Houston uh, with gang ministry. And so like all of us, he was this weird amalgamation of, of good and, and of evil. The meme seems to suggest, well, maybe he deserved to die. And how opposite that is to what we see happening at the Garden of Gethsemane, where Jesus seeing in his mind's eye because he was God, George Floyd, and George Floyd on his very worst day. And Jesus seeing Courtney Kruger on my very worst day and you on your very worst day and knowing, yes, they deserve to die. They don't deserve to be helped. They don't deserve for me to die. And yet in Romans 5, we are told that God proves his love for us in this way that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. It all happened right there on that rock where Jesus has to make the decision, am I going to die for these people who do not deserve? And Jesus says, not my will, Father, but yours. I will do this for them. And that is why we have so much hope. That is why we must look at everybody and see them not as an evil person or a good person, but as someone for whom Christ died. And we know all of those things are true because God is with us.